So, getting on. The last time we began reading Nehemiah 8, we're still in Nehemiah 8, so if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, let's uh, open them to chapter 8. And tonight we're going to go from chapter 8, verses 9 through 12. So we're still not getting through chapter 8 in Nehemiah this, this week. But last time we studied these first uh, eight verses in Nehemiah, and we saw how the children of the Jewish exile we're taking that next step in building an enduring faith. And that was through the hearing of God's word. We learned that the people asked Ezra the scribe, they asked him to bring out the word and to read God's word to them. So Ezra read out of the book of the law and that everyone who could understand, everyone, so from the youngest person able to understand to the oldest that was able to come, they came and listened and they listened for a long time. We figured that Ezra probably preached for at least six hours that day. And then they went on. And we're kind of going to go into that area today. More importantly, what we saw and what we learned is the heart and the attitude they brought before God to hear his word preached. And we learned that they came to hear God's word in unity. They came as a family. Any differences they may have had, they put aside and they came as one. That's really how that, that it reads, is that they came in one. We also learned that they came to hear God's word attentively. They were ready to receive it. Another person said that they came to receive his word with gladness. They came expectantly. They knew that they were hearing God's word and they expected that God would speak to them through his word. We also learned that they came submissively. In other words, they realized that God was God and they're just people. And so they knew that God had wisdom and honor and glory way above, as my brother Yaroslav said, the, the wisdom of man. God's wisdom is so much higher than ours that there's just no comparison between the two. And they came to hear his word diligently. In other words, they were going to hear, hear it and seek to learn from it and to apply that to their lives. So as we continue tonight, um, we're going to continue in our reading and we're going to see how God's word actually did touch many of the people that were there that day who listened to Ezra. And that didn't change. As we, uh, was we, as we continue in our study tonight, I want us to see these points as we read these verses. We want to see how the word, now it jumped ahead, <laughs> led to the people being convicted, the word helped to comfort them. The word helped them to be compassionate. And finally, God's word gave them confidence. So let's stand as we read God's word. Again, Nehemiah chapter 8, starting in verse 9. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all of the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat and drink the sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people saying, Be quiet. For this day is holy, do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Father God, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. You didn't leave us as orphans, directionless, without instructions on how to live in this life, Lord God, but you gave us this book. You gave us your word to help teach us, Lord, to, to give us wisdom, to teach us discernment, to give us the distinction between right and wrong, what's holy and what's sin. And we thank you and praise you for that, Lord. So tonight, Holy Spirit, fall on this house, Lord. Open our ears, open our hearts. Teach us your word. Change our lives, Lord, because we want to be more like you, Jesus. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. So we'll jump right in tonight. So we see first point. 
how God's word convicted them. And I'm going to read again verse 9. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Now, it's kind of funny, because remember last time, I don't know if you remember it, because it was a couple weeks ago, but I was joking about what book Ezra was reading from, since it doesn't really tell us. And I was saying, well, I hope they weren't reading from Numbers, and I don't think they were, although they may have been reading that a little bit. But this is an interesting sentence here in Nehemiah, because it does give us a clue what book Ezra was reading from. He says, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn and weep. And if you do a study, you'll find that this, a similar passage to this occurs primarily in Leviticus 23. But Numbers 29 also tells us that this area, this day that they were referring to, is holy, is the first day of the seventh month. And the reason that was holy to God, because you notice in that passage, in those uh, four verses, we read three times that this day is holy to your God. So in Numbers, uh, or in Leviticus 23, verse 24, the Lord says, Observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with a blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. So this is out of Levit Leviticus, and this is the, the mention of the Feast of Booths. Now, what's the Feast of Booths? The Feast of Booths is... Um, I just totally lost my train of thought. Um, the Feast of Booths was mentioned here as, as what their the reason to celebrate. The reason that... Um, they celebrated this was to celebrate God's provision as they came out of exile from Egypt. But what's interesting here is how, when Ezra read from the book, how the words of the book affected them. Because we hear that they all wept as they heard the words of the law. And I found this interesting. Why? Why they, were they weeping and mourning as they heard God's word? Well. In order to answer that question, I'm going to do, as the youth know that I tend to do in Bible study, I'm going to answer that question with another question. Okay? Why does God have us read his word to start with? Why did he give us the Bible? In order to answer that, I'll go on to another story. In the 17th century, a Puritan reformer preacher named William Bridge used to use an illustration. I guess it was pretty common at the time. And he described the Bible as a looking glass. Do you guys know what a looking glass is? Nowadays, we refer to a looking glass as a mirror. But in his day, it was called the looking glass. And According to Bridge, when we look into a looking glass, and, you, and the Bible is the looking glass, we see a couple of things. When we look into God's Word, we see God's perfection. So using the looking glass analogy, as we looking, look into this, we see God's perfection. And we see how He's intended for things to be. But what else do we see when we look into that mirror? Well, we see our own reflection. And Bridge said, you see your own reflection, your own dirty face. There also you see the creatures that are in the room with you and their emptiness, the emptiness of men and of all the comforts and relations. This is that manifesting light under Christ, and that is true light indeed. In other words, when we read or hear God's word, we see ourselves, we should be able to see ourselves for how we really are. We see how magnificent and pure and holy God is. And we see that person looking back at us. And there's, there's a big difference there between God and us. So, when we come before God to either hear or read his word with a heart like the people we're reading of here in Nehemiah, we become really vulnerable to the truth that God alone is pure and holy. And hopefully what happens to us is like Isaiah, we will 
we will express something like Isaiah did. He said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man, or a woman, of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And again, what Isaiah was saying is, I've seen God in his magnificence, and I'm horrible and wretched. He's convicted. Now, remember the historical context here. We're talking about the children of the Babylonian exile. So as we think about that, imagine how these verses impact them as they think about how their ancestors had strayed so far from God's true and safe path. God had given the land of milk and honey to Abraham and his descendants. It was God that led them safely across the wilderness out of captivity. He, he kept them fed. He kept shoes on their feet that didn't wore out, wear out that entire time. He conquered their, their enemies as he put them into the land, the promised land. And they turned their backs on them. These are the children of those people. They looked in that looking glass and said, wow, we're dirty. And now on top of all that, they've been brought back from exile. God has blessed them. Their temple is rebuilt. He rebuilt their wall miraculously. And they're going, we, we're so blessed. And we've been a people that have turned our backs on them. And I can see They've just seen their sin and how dirty they are. And like, we're, why would we go after these idols? Why do we chase after other nations? There's no gain in that. There's no promise in that. Promise comes from God alone. And yet, here we are. And they're so convicted. So they mourn and they weep. So I hope this is a partial answer now to, to the question of why God wants us to to hear and to read his word. Because hopefully when we come to hear his word in unity, attentively, expectantly, submissively, and diligently, when we come in that way, then the first impact God's word should have is to convict us. For we need to realize that Jesus is God and we're merely his creatures. Now, I'm not here to to bang on you, okay? Because conviction's important, but you know what? Praise God, because we don't have a God that leaves us there, because we have a God that comforts us through his word also. So the second half of verse nine, if you have your Bibles, look at it again. He says, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn and weep. Do not. Have you ever known a person? Do you, do you have a person or a kind of friend, supposedly a friend, who's kind of always pointing out your flaws? Have you ever dealt with a person like that? You know the kind of person I'm speaking of, don't you? This person is one of those people that they always say, hey, why are you doing that that way? You're doing that wrong. Or, you know, you, you really shouldn't dress like that. You don't look well. Or, why, why did you say that? Why wouldn't you say something differently, you know? Now, it's one thing if a person, like my wife does this to me all the time. She says, why did you say that? Maybe you shouldn't say that that way. And I go, at first I'll go, what, what, you know? And then I'll say, okay, you have a point. I, I need to be corrected here, and, and I'm corrected. And hopefully I'm better for it. But I'm not talking about that kind of person. I'm talking about the kind of person that's always kind of picking on you and making fun of you. And, and really what's at the heart of that person is they're trying to make themselves feel better by picking on all your flaws. And they're not doing anything to, to help improve you. I mean, I pick on people, but I generally do it to try to help them get a little better. I make suggestions afterwards. My technique is getting better thanks to my wife's good example, okay? Because I used to be really bad about it. But this person is one of those people, like I, I think they live by the motto that 
well, I'm not happy until you're not happy. And then they're happy, you know? So the cool thing is our God is not like that, okay? He convicts us. And that's a good thing, because we need to be convicted of our sins. We need to see ourselves as we really are so that we can be changed, we can be worked in. And so the Lord amazingly says, yeah, you guys are sinful. Every single one of us is sinful. Not one of us is good. Not one of us seeks what is right. But praise be to God that he, he makes a way for us to come to him. He exposes our sins and shortcomings, but he also provides the way for them to be washed away. The Festival of Booths, which I mentioned earlier, was uh, the celebration, as I said, of how God brought them out of Egypt. And the, in that time, it's a reminder how during that whole 40 years of wandering, they lived in booths. A booth is a temporary tent made from sticks and branches and animal skins and stuff like that. And he provided for them the whole time. But more importantly than this, this, this portion of the festival, and again, we've been talking in Nehemiah how important it is to remember our past so we can celebrate all the good that God has done for us. But on the 10th day of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement. And this day was drawing near, okay? And in the Day of Atonement, an animal sacrifice would be made that would temporarily wash the people clean of their sins. So he says... Don't mourn, don't weep. God knows you're sinful, but he's made a way of atoning for you. So Ezra and the Levites encouraged the people that way, reminding them of this, of God's goodness and grace and mercy, that God himself would absolve them of their sins. And as I was doing this, or reading this and studying this, it kind of struck me how so much of the time we as Christians don't take the time to remember that Jesus has done this for us. And it wasn't just temporarily, but he came and he hung on that cross for us. And we tend to forget this. A lot of times people kind of start fixating on their sins. I probably do this on occasion where I start looking in that mirror and I'm going, man, that face looking back at me, it's awfully dirty, it's awfully ugly. And it's good to be convicted of those sins, but the problem is, is that when you're only focused on those sins, then you're ignoring what Jesus did for us. In a way, it's dishonoring to God. Because Jesus is the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, Listen to that. The joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's Hebrews 12, 2. And that's important, guys, because when we get so fixated on, on our condition, and the fact is we're still sinful, every one of us, even if we've been walking with the Lord for 50 years, this, the stain of sin is there. But you know what? When we're focused on those shortcomings and failures, in essence, we pick up a pile of dung and throw it at Jesus on the cross saying, what you did for me wasn't enough. And that's, that's not a good thing, guys. We need to remember what he's done for us and be glad about that. We need to be comforted by that. Do we still have sin in our lives? Yes. But Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, hung on that cross to make you righteous before God. He justified us. And as I told my young group, youth group, if you don't want to remember that, Theological term, justified, think of it this way. It's just as if I never sinned. And that's how we're able to come before the throne because Jesus has washed us clean. Hallelujah, it's just as if we never sinned. And let's remember that and take comfort in that. We need to be like the people 
that we read about here. Because Jesus said, you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Thank you, Lord. And we studied that in 1 Peter, in case you forgot it. I just find it amazing that he would come and justify us. And the slate is wiped clean. Past sins, present sins, future sins. Hold on to that. Be comforted by it. Okay, the next thing that God's Word does for people is it should make us compassionate. Compassionate. Verse 10, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. So, so far we've seen, right? Conviction, confidence. These are the wonderful gods, the gifts that God gives us through the hearing and reading of his word. But we can't stop here. We can't stop there person who has been convicted of their sin and repents is saved. Great. That's a wonderful thing. The person that's saved has confidence before God, before God, and that's a marvelous thing. However, if we just stop there, then we're focused on ourselves, and we don't want to be self-focused in our faith. There are too many Christians especially in America, that are so focused on their personal relationship with God that they never go out to the world. It's great to have a personal relationship with the Lord, but we need to make sure that the, Lord, the world isn't just burning in flames behind us as we're staring at our own face in that mirror. And I think, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but maybe that's why the evangelical church has so little power in today's culture. Because too many of us are focused on what Jesus does for me and my relationship and not what I can do for Jesus, for God, and for his children in service. So the personal relationship, it's crucial. But so is relationship with your other brothers and sisters here. And more importantly, or just importantly, like Arthur did this week, sharing with people that don't know Christ. Because without that happening, then God's word never goes beyond here. So it's interesting here. So look at what Ezra said to the people in verse 10. It's easy to miss this part because it's, it's kind of written in a strange way, but it says, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. Bet you missed that when you read that. I almost did. Send portions to anyone that, that, that has nothing ready. Ezra was telling the people, God's word convicted you of your sin? Great. Don't mourn, weep or mourn because God has provided a way of atonement for you. Now he says, go celebrate. And while you're celebrating, make sure that your celebration includes those around you that don't have the means to celebrate. Bring everyone in. He says, go have compassion on your neighbor just as God has had compassion on you. I imagine kind of that Ezra's message was reinforced by this passage out of Deuteronomy. This is Deuteronomy 14, 28, and 29. It says, at the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. It's, it, there's two things interesting there. First, it's clear that God wants us to share with those and take care of those that don't have the means of taking care of themselves. But the interesting thing there is that 
The Lord your God may bless you in all your work. In other words, the Lord's telling us when we're generous, when we're compassionate, when we share with those that don't know him or don't have, then we're going to be blessed even more. What a great God we have. In the New Testament, James puts it this way. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. In other words, we can't just have faith. We must have works. Visit orphans and widows in their affliction. And of course, keep oneself unstained from the world. The point being this, is that God expects us not only to have a deeply personal relationship with him, but he expects that relationship is going to transform us. And it's going to transform us from being the self-centered person that I am to somebody that cares about others. And that's God's mission for all of us, to be transformed from this inward-looking, scared, I got to get what's mine, to a person that says, you need a shirt, I will take the shirt off of my back and give it to you because I have another one back at home and you don't. Martin Luther put it this way, I love this. Martin Luther said, Hence, as our Heavenly Father has in Christ freely come to our aid, we ought freely to help our neighbor through our body and its works. And each one should become, as it were, a Christ to the other. That is, that we may be truly Christians. And that's where the name comes from, right? Christian, Christ-like. And so we ought to be, as, just as, as God was to us, merciful, forgiving, compassionate, caring. All those things should be the outflowing of our lives to the community and the world around us. And finally, God's word gives us confidence. We're going to kind of jump around verses here. The second half of verse 10 says, And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Verse 11, so the Levites calmed all the people saying, be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. So in these verses, we see another purpose for God expecting us to hear or to read his word. And it's so that the, his child, that's you, that's me, his children can be confident in him, that he will provide for our very needs, every need. We can see how we can have this deep, abiding trust in God because in these verses we see three gifts. I don't know if you saw them there, but we see three gifts that God, God gives his child. Do you see them yet? They're in the passage if you're looking at your Bible. Those three gifts are peace, joy, and strength. In this translation, it doesn't specifically, it, th there are different translations, but in this, um, in the ESV, it says, be quiet, be still. In the NASB, it's probably a little bit better is because it says, be still. In other words, peace. The word, hatha, literally means to hold your peace. To hold your peace. And it's interesting because in context we need to remember that Ezra and the Levites are trying to encourage the people to have a correct frame of mind. Because they're, they're grieving, right? They're still grieving over their sins, the sins of their ancestors. And the Levites want them to shift their focus from their sin to remembering the mercy and forgiveness and all the blessings God had showered on them. Be still. Another translation there of that word. Be quiet. Be still. When I read that and saw the different translation, then I started thinking about Psalm 46, where, where um, David wrote, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Be still. Remember what God has done for you. Yeah, we've all sinned. But God's provided for us. He's given us atonement. He gave them atonement. Our sins are forgiven. 
Be still and remember that. Now, if these people, who had a temporary atonement, a temporary forgiveness through the sacrifice of an animal, were made confident by this, how much more confident should we be, Christian? Because we have the permanent atonement. We're covered. We should have much more confidence than they did, but so many of us lack that. God gave us Jesus. He was a perfect sacrifice. And not only that, Jesus himself gave us something more before he left. John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace, hasa, I give to you. Not as the world gives you peace do I give you, but he gives his peace. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Abide in Jesus. Seek the Holy Spirit. If we do these things, we have, we'll have a calmness and a peace that the world doesn't have and can't have. You can't have this sort of peace without Jesus. So the Lord gives us peace. The next thing, next thing we saw him giving us was joy. The Levites told these people, they have the joy of the Lord. Now, at first glance, this might seem kind of strange because these people are grieving over their fallenness. They're, they're convicted of their sins. And so the Levites are saying, don't worry, be still. You have the joy of the Lord. I'm like, I'm sitting there crying over how dirty I am. I have joy? Well, this is interesting. It set me on a little word search again. The word translated joy, which is hatva, it occurs only twice in the Bible, in, in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament. And the definition is gladness and joy. Like, okay, well, that, that didn't really give me much edification. Like, well, it already says joy, so the definition is gladness and joy. So I looked at the other passage where this word chedva is. And it's in 1 Chronicles 16. So turn with me in 1 Chronicles 16, if you would. So I want to read from this. I think it's important that you see it for yourself as we're reading it. 1 Chronicles 16, and we're going to start reading in verse 23. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy Hedva, strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in holy array. I think the author of Chronicles said that much better than I possibly could. It seems to be humankind's tendency to look at material circumstances, especially in our nation, for comfort and joy. But the author of Chronicles, and by the way, it's kind of interesting because many of the people think the author of Chronicles was Ezra, the same Ezra the scribe that's been reading to the people here, um, tells us that true joy... True joy, pleasure, delight, exaltation is to be found in acknowledging God for who He is, singing to Him, proclaiming His salvation, telling of His glory and wonderful deeds, fearing and praising Him. That's true joy. True joy for us, in addition, is found in Jesus. It's found in Jesus. As true joy isn't found in a good steady job, that's a blessing. It's not found in a beautiful wife or a handsome husband, those are certainly blessings. It's not even found in our children. Our children usually bring us much joy. I said usually. 
But that's not true joy. True joy comes from worshiping Jesus and bringing glory and honor and praise to him, acknowledging what he's done. That's true joy. So we have that. So we have peace. We have joy. And finally, we have God as our strength. Verse 10. And do not be confident, or do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Isn't that interesting? There are several definitions of the word strength. I think I'm behind on slides. I don't know. Maybe I'm not. There are several definitions of the word strength, and uh, they mean place or a means of safety, protection, refuge, a stronghold. And I think what Nehemiah was trying to tell us here is not that we are physically strong because of how great our God is, although sometimes we are afforded that, that supernatural strength because of the Lord, whether it's spiritually or physically. But no, what he's trying to convey to us is that in the Lord, we have protection, we have safety, we have a stronghold. What is a stronghold? I thought that was interesting. I'm like, we always talk about strongholds. What's the definition of a stronghold? Does anybody know? Olga, do you know you like, you like words? <laughs> a stronghold, get this, a stronghold is a fortress or a castle. That's a stronghold. I thought that was interesting. So David put it this way. In Psalm 28, the Lord is my strength. The Lord is my stronghold. The Lord is my fortress and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength. He is the fortress, the, the castle of his people. He is a saving refuge of his anointed. Isn't that amazing? And then, I, and then I read that. I typed it in here. Actually, I copied and pasted it. But I, I put that in there. And then I was immediately convicted. Why? Because I thought of how often I've forgotten to put my trust in Jesus first and tried to do things on my own strength rather than resting in my stronghold, my fortress, I'm going, I, I got this, I can do this, you know, and things usually don't work out very well. But remember when we were studying the end of Nehemiah 7, that one of the foundational elements of having an enduring faith is having a trust in the Lord. A trust in the Lord. And it looks like Alphenia boogied, but... Alphenia could tell us, hey, trust in the Lord. He provided her means for going to India. Because she was trying to do it on her own strength at first. She's like, hey, we can't do this. I don't have this money. I'm like, I know you don't. But he does. And he provides. When I forget, when we forget to go to the Lord first, to trust him, to seek him, we're essentially telling Jesus that I don't really trust that you know what's best for me. I'm telling him that I know what's right for my life and he doesn't. But that's wrong. David and Nehemiah both teach us in these verses that our true strength, our saving refuge, our safety and protection is found in our God and Savior. And that's amazing. He is our strength. He has a plan for us, and it's for our good. And we need to trust in that. So, there you have it. These verses show us that uh, this is why it's important for us to, to read, to hear the Lord's work. word. I'm sorry. Because He uses it to transform us. The word touched these people deeply, and it should touch us. They were convicted. They were comforted. They became compassionate, and they had confidence as a result of hearing God's word. 
And I hope we have all had a similar experience through hearing God's word tonight. Now, before I close, when Jan and I, by the way, um, we had a, sorry I missed you guys at Bible study, but we had a blessed trip to Colorado and it was just beautiful and wonderful seeing some of God's creation. But one of the days we were there, was, we were doing our devotional and I read a passage from Charles Spurgeon that I thought was just amazing. And I just want to to read this to you tonight in closing. So this is from Charles Spurgeon's uh, Morning and Evening. And, uh, you know, just close your eyes or just, just focus on what Charles said because he was an amazing teacher. He says, Nothing gives the believer so much joy as fellowship with Christ. He enjoys, as others do, the common blessings of life. He can be glad for both God's gifts and God's works, but even with them all added together, he does not find such delight as in the unrivaled person of his Lord Jesus. He has, no, he has wine that no vineyard on earth ever yielded. He has bread that all the cornfields of Egypt could never produce. Where can we find such sweetness like we have tasted in unity with our beloved? In our opinion, the joys of earth are little better than husks for pigs compared with Jesus, the heavenly manna. We would rather have one mouthful of Christ's love and a sip of his fellowship than a whole world full of physical delights. What is the chaff to the wheat? What is the sparkling plastic? to the true diamond? What is a dream to the glorious reality? What is life's happiness at its best compared to our Lord Jesus in his most detested condition? If you know anything of the spiritual life, you will confess that our highest, purest, and most enduring joys must be the tree of life's fruit, which is in the middle of the paradise of God. All earthly bliss is of this earth, but the comforts of Christ's presence are like himself, heavenly. We can reflect on our communion with Jesus and find no regrets of emptiness. There are no dregs in this wine. The joy of the Lord is solid enduring. For nourishment, consolation, exhilaration and refreshment, no wine can rival the love of Jesus. Let us drink until we're full. Isn't that amazing? He's our stronghold, guys. We have joy, we have peace, and we have strength because of Jesus. Father God, we just thank you and praise you that you give us so much. That you loved us while we were still wretched. You washed us clean, Jesus, by hanging on the cross for us because you love us so much and you're so merciful. And Lord, as we are convicted of our sins, let us, let us be gladdened by what you've done for us, Lord. Let us have confidence to go out into the world, Lord. Give us a compassion. Give us your compassion and your heart, Lord. <coughs> to tell the world all about you, Lord God. And Lord, let us take refuge in you always. Let us just allow you to be our strength. Let us turn to you first in all things. And Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you didn't just leave us orphans, directionless, but you gave us this book, these basic instructions on how to live our lives, Lord. So, Father, we thank you for the Son. Jesus, we thank you for Holy Spirit. And, Lord, that you would just bless this house. Bless everyone as we go out into this week, Lord God. Give us your strength, your peace, your joy. Let us be beacons into a world that needs you so desperately, Lord. Lord, we lift up those that need your healing touch tonight. Lord, those that are uh, far from you spiritually. Please draw them back, Lord. Lord, protect everyone as we go out this week and just help us to walk in your peace and joy every moment of every day. We say all these things and ask them in Jesus' precious name. Amen.